My name is Suprabha Seshan and I've lived here for 20 years. We're a very small group of people who've been concerned with uh, the rapid disappearance of native biodiversity and particularly of plants and, and we believe um, plants are the basis for all existence. And without the plants, you can't have the animals. Without the plants, you can't have human life. Without plants, you don't have the biosphere. And of course, everybody has their different emphases, and someone who's protecting tigers will say something about tigers. But I think that's okay. I think we each have to find the beings that we love, or the places that we love, and then we find a way to make it possible for them to um, have another chance. In the rainforest, you have this vast, um, array of life forms, the, just the different ways that plants like to grow. And the, the ecosystem gardeners here work with that. What are you doing? Um, spreading the roots because this plant had some fungal problem. So I dipped the roots in the fungicide. Um, after I dipped in the fungicide water, all the roots become stick together. And before I plant them, I want to spread the roots. Otherwise all the roots will stick together and it's not good for the plant. The roots will die little by little. This land, uh, 10 years ago, this whole slope going down was the color of this ground here. This is compacted, it's a road now, but basically it was this color. And this whole slope was given over to ginger cultivation, um, which is an annual crop, and they have to make these beds, and they make the beds in this way that you know, they point downwards, and then there's all this soil erosion. Then they leave it for a season, and then there's ginger again the next season. Massive erosion, massive fungicide, pesticide, etc. Subsequently, we bought it and then um, just left it alone for the greater part. And you can see, if you leave something alone for eight, ten years or so, that's what you get there. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's a terrific uh, case of what can happen in 10 years. And so this is the back entrance to the place and we have the cow shed here. The cows go and graze in the, in the valley field on the other side. And there's, uh, we collect the dung and then there's a biogas pit and then we make biogas so we can also cook with biogas and then the manure is then used on the land or in the farm uh, or in the, in the garden. I knew little Atharinda!
it's, it's the greatest joy, I would say, to see land that's been completely desertified to come back to life because that's where you recognize the true power of the natural world, that it can heal. It's also the greatest tragedy, or not just, it's not a tragedy, it's a horror to see primary forest converted to desert. And this is really exciting to see this difference just over here, what the land has been, a monoculture or completely down to a meter's height. I mean, here's something that should be 40 meters high and it's down to a meter here. And here we have something that's coming back to some form of um, natural structure, natural community. So this entire valley, we have the upper end of the, the watershed and then the stream, which is perennial, flows out into the neighbors and it's the cleanest water in this area and then out through their fields. Um, so we collect it in a tank and then pump it up to the top to the water tower and then it releases back into the various uh, slopes where we have either cultivation or dairy or whatever. So it's a really nice cycle of the water from the land. It just goes back up to the hill and then it comes down. Of course in the monsoon, you know, we're underwater for six, seven months. So you don't really require this then, but in the dry season it is absolutely necessary for all our various projects. Well, coming into this little piece of land, this little piece of forest, the air is different, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. it's easier to breathe, mm -hmm. it's a multitude of different species mm -hmm. compared to the tea and mm -hmm. rubber plantations around here. Mm -hmm. it, it's really amazing. You feel proud? <laughs> <laughs> you sure? I, yeah, there is, a, there is a belonging, I would say, uh, in the sense that I, I sleep better here and, uh, um, and to wake up to these calls and sounds is because a bunch of people decided to protect this land and uh, I'm very proud of that, 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 you know, and however it was done uh, means that there's that many more acres, even if it's very small, with these trees or with these plants and with these insects, with 240 different species of birds and the elephants come in and snakes and so on. And so it's all happening in this sort of quiet way. So of course one's mm -hmm. proud, but that doesn't mean it's easy, you know. <laughs> you can see here there's this little very slender thread so Lali has used that to almost stitch these plant roots onto this woody vine and she would have originally just introduced a small area of this filmy fern or this moss or this peperomia and the idea would be that it would take root at some point and the roots would then find their nutrition from the wash that comes down the, the surface of the tree or the vine and then uh, the plant grows and then the plant then you know survives the season and then it flowers the next season or if it's mosses it will sporulate or whatever and then over time th this is spread across this whole surface so we're working down to that level of little square centimeters of experimentation 
and then you know you work all the way across to a few acres so I've seen, you know, when we gone, picked up a plant in the wild and we brought it back, the first question that everybody has here is where is it going to be happy here? And the conditions of the place, you hear the cicadas. Oh my. <laughs> Those are the cicadas. Yeah. What a strong sound. Can you tell me why you do this? Why you tie them up like that? Because uh, these plants are growing on the tree trunks. So that will give uh, plants like to hang. You're spending a great part of your life in this uh, small garden or this mm -hmm. piece of piece of land. What is your strongest motivation? <laughs> well, this piece of land itself is the motivation for this work, or these plants are the motivation for this work. And the sense that, um, you know, I think gardeners have this, it's, it's a kind of a peculiar thing that it's almost like the plant is asking you to pollinate it or whatever. There's a very strong relationship with plants. And we, we are like pollinators, like the, like the hummingbirds or the, sunbirds and you know butterflies so there's a very strong relationship with plants but that's not the solution to the global crisis the global crisis has to be stopped at a global scale and what we're saying is that we and everybody else needs to do that thing that they are the best at and we are good at this with, you know, and, and so you would have to, you know, if you're a storyteller, then you would have to do that to the best of your ability, but we all work towards the same cause. It can't be a single solution for a... I mean, the single solution is stop global warming, but uh, is to stop fossil fuel exploitation. <laughs> but if we're not do if that's not happening, all this has to happen anyway. This has to happen anyway, but this is not the answer to the ending of the deforestation of the Amazon. That's much more important than this. This is important for us and for these plants here, but at the global level, then it's anybody's guess what the solution is. If there was one, you know, we would have found it by now. Mm. I have to go to the Amazon. <laughs> yeah, I went Wish there. Wish me luck. Yeah, I went there and it completely changed, uh, you know, how I saw the patterns of what the was happening. I see that you love this. Yeah. <laughs> I can I, tell. I love this group. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, how long, how many years have you been working here? 25 years. 25? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Is it going to be 25 more? I don't know. <laughs>